Hello and welcome to lecture 2 in week 1 of your constitutional law course. Today we are going to look at um, some of the key themes that have been outlined for this week. What is it that constitutions do and do democratic societies need a constitution? Let's begin with a slight recap of uh, the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed that constitution can have written and unwritten components. Likewise, there can be constitutions themselves, an entire constitution that is unwritten. The British constitution is an interesting example of a constitution that is not written down in one single document. It comprises of many, many uh, documents and many unwritten conventions. So you can have constitutions that are written in a single document. They are constitutions that are mostly written in a single document, supplemented with conventions, and you can have constitutions that are completely unwritten. We saw that constitutions provide a charter for governance. In that sense, they constitute the government, they constitute the state. Uh, and uh, by constituting the state, we mean that they define the powers, the limits, and the structures of government. We saw that the constitution is the supreme law of the land. So any other law, the ordinary uh, laws passed by parliament, any action taken by the executive, all of these have to be in compliance with the constitution. To the extent that they are not in compliance with the constitution, they are invalid. We saw that the constitution places limits and constraints on what the state can do. And we saw that we have the longest constitution in the world. So let's take the first idea that we discussed, that a constitution constitutes the state and it provides the powers, it defines the powers and uh, limits and structures of the state. If that is the case, then every state, every polity will have a constitution. Imagine an absolute monarchy uh, where all the power of the state, all the lawmaking power, all the power to implement the laws, to resolve any disputes, all of that is vested in one single individual, the monarch of that, the king of that, uh, that state. In that situation, the constitution of that state might have a single rule. And that rule will be that anything that the monarch says, anything that the king says is, is the law. But that is the constitution of that state. That, that's, that one line principle is the constitution of that state. So in its most basic form, every state will have a constitution. The constitution of India that came into force in 1950 was itself preceded by a range of colonial instruments that, act, that served the same constitutive function. So we had the, uh, the government of India act 1935, which uh, heavily influenced the Constitution of India 1950, and that was a constitutional document. Before that was the Government of India Act 1919, so on and so forth. We had colonial constitutions. Uh, in a similar way, you can talk about Mughal constitutionalism. What were the constitutional principles? What was the basic constitutional rules of um, uh, during the Mughal period, was there was, was there a single constitute you know single set of constitutional rules, or did that change over the course of the uh, the Mughal period? These are questions that one can ask. But the larger point that I'm making is that every polity has a constitution defined when we define constitutions as uh, as a document or as as a set of rules that constitute the state. The Constitution of India 1950 does something different than the constitutions that came before it, the colonial constitutions and the Mughal constitutions. They place, the Constitution of India 1950 places limits and constraints on what the state can do. So it does not just empower or define who has the power, it also places limits and constraints on what the state can do. And uh, the best example of that is, of course, fundamental rights, uh, where the, the state cannot transgress the limits set by fundamental rights. So the Indian constitution then follows a tradition of what is called constitutionalism. The idea that the 
the constitution sets limits and constraints on what the state can do and it is only by observing the limits and uh, and constraints that the constitution places that the state and the government of the day is legitimate so that is that is the idea of constitutionalism and the indian uh, constitution the constitution of india 1950 follows the uh, uh, the the approach of constitutionalism so if the the so so this is this is a a point to keep in mind about the indian constitution that it this is limits and constraints on what the state can do and that is why the constitution of india follows a different tradition from that of an absolute monarchy so it would not be right to say that the indian constitution is just another constitution like the constitution of an absolute monarchy might be while that's true at the very abstract level in its design the indian constitution does different things most specifically it places limits on what the state can do and because we have the longest constitution in the world therefore that means that there are many 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 more limits uh, upon the state in the indian constitution as compared to many of the other constitutions so what happens when the constitution does not speak about a particular issue if the in the indian constitution speaks about many issues there are other constitutions for example the american constitution that is very brief uh, or comparatively very brief and does not touch upon many issues so if that is the case if the constitution does not speak about those issues that means there is no constitutional limit um, upon the state in in dealing with those issues and so then it would devolve upon the state or the government of the day the um, the the government in terms of the executive power the the legislature in terms of the um, the legislative power to deal with that issue um, so think about um, many questions around uh, technology uh, you know advanced technology or the regulation of the internet which might not even have been in the um, imagination of of the of the framers of the constitution and uh, so they they have not discussed these issues they have not spoken about these issues so today the uh, if if those issues have to be regulated they have to be regulated by the by by parliament or by the executive of of the day uh, the constitution might have principles it might have rights it might have other kinds of restrictions that might be applicable but there might not be any direct provision with respect to some of these issues okay now this begs the question are constitutions undemocratic why do i say so think about it this way the constitution says that we the people are giving ourselves this constitution why does the constitution speak of the people why does it not speak of why does it not say we the constituent assembly are giving ourselves this constitution because the as we discussed in the previous lecture the framers of the constitution wanted to in symbolically entrench the idea that this was a democratic constitution it was a constitution where the power all the political power in society lies with the people and why is that an important idea the important of political democracy is a recognition that each of us individually each of us as individuals are free equal rational human beings and we are best suited to make decisions about our shared lives right so it is for us to decide how we should govern ourselves the consent of the governed is the most basic principle of political legitimacy today democracy is the most legitimate form of uh, of organizing political societies uh, today i mean imagine if, whether it be your um, you know local rwa or uh, your resident welfare association or the government of the day if uh, you were if you have to take a decision and that decision is being imposed upon you rather than uh, you know everyone getting a chance to speak and to vote for that uh, that decision or that uh, government the 
that that government or decision would will will always be challenged on the ground that it is not democratic so democracy is uh, give lends itself uh, uh, to a lot of legitimacy and the reason why it lends itself to a lot of legitimacy is because democracy recognizes that we are all free equal human beings and we should have an equal say in uh, how we are governed there's also a recognition there that in the most basic matters that in, that affect us the basic matters of how our lives should be governed there can be no expertise on top of us these are matters in which each of us has our own views and our each of our views are legitimate views and so therefore what we do is we collect our views together we can deliberate upon those views in in society we can try and convince each other but at the end of the day we each get to have an equal say and no more than an equal say in how uh, such issues are resolved right so that is why we don't say that we should have a technocratic rule a rule by experts we don't say we should have a monarchy or some rule by divine power uh, we say that we should have a democracy and that each of us should have an equal say on the most basic uh, matters of how this country should be governed right so consent of the governed is in entrenched into our constitution in the very first uh, words of the constitution so we now come upon a contradiction on the one hand we say that we the people should be making decisions about how we should be governed but on the other hand the constitution has placed limits on what we the people here and now today can do for in terms of our own governance because the people who were there and then in the uh, during the framing of the constitution the members of the constituent assembly have placed limits on what we can do today here and now through our own parliament so the question is is this constitution then undemocratic, undemocratic? and our constitutions generally constitutions that follow the tradition of constitutionalism are they inherently undemocratic because they are limiting the power of people today here and now to govern themselves in the manner that they best see fit because they've placed constitutional limitations and these constitutional limitations have been placed by people who are generally long dead and gone so this is the the uh, idea of the dead hand of the past is the dead hand of the past coming to govern us and limit our own democratic potential and the scope of our of giving expression to our own democratic ideals so put another way the the idea here is this that a constitution limits what the government of the day can do a democracy allows people to express their political will through the their uh, governments but since the constitution limits what the people today can get their government to do constitutions are undemocratic this is this is a question that we need to ask are constitutions undemocratic now this this question let's we can unpack this question in uh, in multiple ways let us look at the framing of our own constitution who were the people who got to uh, to exercise franchise and exercise their franchise and elect the people who went on to uh, to uh, sit in the constituent assembly first there were no direct uh, elections to the constituent assembly there were elections had taken place in 1945 to the various provincial legislatures and these provincial legislatures then uh, subsequently uh, nominated people from the provincial legislatures or even outside to the constituent assembly and the princely states the the rulers of the princely states nominated uh, uh, the nominated members to the constituent assemblies so the constituent assembly itself was not a particularly representative body it was not based on universal adult franchise everyone didn't get a vote even the elections the 1945 elections to the provincial uh, legislatures uh, had were not based on universal adult franchise there were restrictions there were restrictions in terms of 
for pro uh, property ownership, in terms of uh, literacy, in terms of taxes. So only people who met these criteria or certain criteria of having some amount of property, of paying certain amount of taxes, of having some amount of education, only such people could vote. Uh, that meant that a large part of the country was excluded. So uh, the numbers vary, but in different parts of the uh, state, about between 15 to 28 percent of the adult population, only about 15 to 28 percent of the adult population was part of the uh, was on the electoral rolls. Now this was even worse for women, for uh, the what were then called the depressed classes, scheduled castes, sh what we now would call scheduled castes, scheduled tribes. So for example, um, there are studies to indicate that in UP, only about 2.5% of the adult scheduled caste population was on the electoral rolls. So the, the the elections, the selection of people, the nomination of process of people to get into the constituent assembly itself was not very democratic. Next, look at the look at who is in the constituent assembly, uh, who makes it to the constituent assembly. Again, there is a large scale exclusion of historically marginalized groups from the constituent uh, assembly. Uh, you have only uh, you have very few uh, women. You have only 15 uh, uh, women in the constituent assembly. There are very few um, uh, the, the very few scheduled caste members, scheduled tribe members, um, much lower than there uh, than than their sh share of the population in the constituent assembly. So if the Constituent Assembly was not representative in terms of who got to vote. It wasn't representative in terms of who was on the Constituent Assembly. And they definitely cannot speak to the people here and now, you and I today, who weren't even alive at that point and could therefore not have been part of the Constituent Assembly. The question does arise, why do they get to place limits upon, the, uh, upon us here and now? Right? So that is that is the, the question that we have to ask. Why do they get to set the agenda? Why do they get to uh, restrict what we can do, what we cannot do? So let me take an example. In the um, constituent assembly, in the, in, the, in the original text of the constitution, uh, there is no mention of the right to privacy. There was a provision which dealt with uh, certain aspects of privacy that that uh, provision did not find place in the ultimate constitution. You might even say that that provision was thereby rejected. But because the framers rejected it, should that should that limit how today we think about the right to privacy and whether the right to privacy is protected by the constitution, is not protected, should be protected, should not be protected. Why should the agenda on, on privacy uh, be set by, by people long dead and Gone, right? So that is the question, and that's a th that question has many, many, many ramifications in how we think about the constitution and how we engage with many issues that come up regularly. As we will see many of these issues through the um, uh, through the weeks ahead. Now, it is in the nature of constitutionalism that it places limits on on the democratic possibilities today. Why is that? We saw that constitutionalism seeks to limit um, what the government can do. How does it seek to limit what the government can do? It can only limit what the government can do when the government cannot very easily overcome those limits. Right? It cannot very easily, if, if the government had the power to just pass any law and, and by passing a law overthrow the constitution, then the constitution wouldn't be placing any significant limits on the, um, on, on the government of the day. So what the constitution does is it makes it very difficult to amend the constitution. The constitution is much more difficult to amend compared to ordinary laws. And that is both to ensure that, that the limits are observed and also to give the constitution some longevity so that the underlying structures of the state have some stability. If every government every five years could change the very fundamentals of the state, then we, won't, we would have a lot of instability and uh, that is 
seen to be not very good for um, the, 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 a well-functioning society and a well-functioning polity. So if that is the case, we are uh, in a situation where the constitution is difficult to amend. The constitution places limits on what the government of the day can do or cannot do. And at the same time, the constitution says that we are democratic and we, the people here and now today, can and should have uh, should govern ourselves and we are the source of all uh, sovereign power in the state so there therein lies the contradiction and this issue becomes even more stark in the indian context because there are certain parts of the constitution that can never be amended now if you look at the uh, the amendment provisions of the constitution there are certain provisions of the constitution that can be amended by ordinary law the constitution itself provides for that there are certain other parts of the constitution that can be amended only by following a special majority uh, procedure but it's not very onerous there are certain other parts of the constitution particularly those that deal with federalism that require the ratification of half the states so the gst um, uh, the amendment to the constitution to bring in the uh, the entire GST framework required, for example, the ratification of half the states. So that is a much more onerous uh, way of amending the constitution. But on top of that, the Supreme Court of India has said that there are certain basic features of the constitution, some basic structural elements of the constitution that are core to the identity of this constitution. These include that we are democratic, that we are secular, that we are a federal uh, state, that there is separation of powers with judicial review, that there is judicial independence, and the judiciary can review the actions of other parts of the um, state. And these are inherent, uh, these are core to the identity of this constitution. These cannot be amended away at all. If you amend these features out of the constitution, then it won't remain this constitution. And so the court has said that these features can never be amended. So today, even when there is a constitutional amendment, that the Supreme Court can look at the constitutional amendment and say, does the, is this constitutional amendment itself valid? Or does it violate the basics, what is called the basic structure of the constitution? Does it violate the basic structure of the constitution? So, um, the uh, in the in the last few years the the indian supreme court struck down the national judicial appointments commission for violating the principle of judicial independence and said that this this amendment to the constitution is invalid because it strikes at the basic structure of the constitution currently before the court the repeal of article 370 which is also a constitutional amendment is um, lying with the um, uh, is lying with the supreme court the ews uh, economically weaker section reservation provision that also brought in through a constitutional amendment is also lying before the courts and the courts have to look at whether these uh, the repeal of article 370 or the ews reservation whether uh, these uh, these amendments to the constitution violate the constitution uh, violate the basic structure of the constitution what this means is that the framers of the constitution had a big a huge agenda setting power this was the limits that they imposed were were strong limits these were these were not limits that could be overcome lightly and the question that we have to ask ourselves is why should they have the power to limit our uh, uh, limit what what what, what uh, provisions we would want to introduce into the constitution think for yourself if you were on the constituent assembly if there was a constituent assembly today and if you were on the constituent assembly what kind of provisions might you have wanted to see in the constitution put yourself in that please and then ask yourself why shouldn't you have that power why shouldn't you have that power to decide what should go into the constitution and what should not go into the constitution? What the basic framework of the state should look like? And that is the question 
that we ask when we say our constitutions undemocratic how would you respond to that question you can say of course yes the constitution is undemocratic and that we shouldn't have constitutions but the question then arises if you can't have a if you don't have a constitution how do you have stability in society if every government can can change the basic structure of the society the basic principles on which the society and the polity uh, the the state is organized at its own whim and fancy then how do you ha how do you have any kind of certainty in society further you know issues arise where at the moment there's a lot of hysteria there's a there's a lot of passion um there's some kind of an emergency and uh, uh and there is a lot of of upheaval in society and the government might be pushed to take certain decisions that with the benefit of hindsight we might think were not necessarily the right decisions constitutions serve to place a break on uh, the state in these situations it takes a long term view and says that there are certain non negotiables we are setting out these non negotiables and whatever policy decision that you have to take take within the framework of these non negotiables so that the certain basic interests that we think are most fundamental to the governance of this country are protected and you don't get swayed by the passing passions of the day and remove these particular hurdles so that is why we have constitutions that is why we want to limit constitution uh, limit the power of the uh, government we also want to ensure that because the democratic system is based on is based on majority voting people who are perpetual losers uh, perpetual losers because they don't have the numbers to constitute the majority that they don't uh, lose out uh, in the political process and that they have certain guarantees and protections because we have seen and history has been um, witness to the tyranny of the majority where majorities can act in very tyrannical ways and by majorities and minorities we uh, hear i mean not only for example religious majorities or minorities but minorities and majorities based on a range of ascriptive identities range of identities that could be sexual minorities they could be religious minorities they could be cultural minorities they could be linguistic minorities they could be political minorities in terms of their set of political beliefs and we have seen in history is witness to the fact that minorities of all hues and stripes have faced persecution at the hands of tyrannical majorities unless there are certain strong checks and balances so that is what the constitution seeks to do and that is where constitutionalism comes from the idea of constitutionalism limited government and the idea of limited government comes from the fact that the the government is the uh, biggest bully in the backyard it is the uh, it it holds the most power and therefore is therefore has the um, most ability to infringe upon certain basic guarantees and rights that uh, that we might want people to have and so therefore the constitution seeks to limit the powers of the government so there is a tension here on the one hand we might need the government to be limited on the other hand the moment we li place limits on the government we are recognize we are uh, saying we we are um, admitting to a distrust in democratic possibilities and how do we ba balance these two it might be a conundrum that is unresolvable and debate continues to this date on whether uh, whether uh, constitutions are undemocratic but the the it, this is not just a theoretical debate this has a lot of implications on how we conduct our um, our constitutional business for example the basic structure doctrine that i told you about is that a valid doctrine or is that something that the court should rethink should it place these hard limits on what can be amended cannot be amended or should it say no um 
we we should allow for as much amendment as possible because if you have a very rigid amendment procedure or if you say that there are certain amendments that are not possible then you are being undemocratic you could uh, this has uh, the the question of uh, constitutionalism and democracy and whether constitutions are uh, undemocratic has a bearing on what should be the appropriate role of the judiciary when it uh, when it when a law made by parliament is challenged before it on the ground that uh, the, that it, that the law violates the constitution should it give a lot of deference to the parliament or should it um, place it place the law under the most searching scrutiny to understand whether it has complied with the constitution or not on the one hand you could say that because you want to enforce the limits of the constitution any law that looks like it is violating the constitution has to be the parliament has to have very very strong justification before we before the uh, judges should allow the, the the law to stand on the other hand you could argue that because we live in a democracy and we want the people here and now through their representatives in parliament to have a say in how they should be governed therefore we should give the greatest amount of deference to uh, to a law made by parliament and it is only when the str most the, the strongest of cases is made out that this there's no way that this law can survive constitutional scrutiny only then should judges strike down that law Hey, these are just a few examples of the kinds of issues that come up when um, because of this conundrum between constitutionalism and democracy and whether constitutions are and con whether constitutionalism is undemocratic okay we will pause we will uh, stop this lecture here and we will return um, for the third lecture and take forward um, our introduction to some of the key issues and debates in uh, in constitutional law thank you